And even when it seems the answer's no The promises of God will find their yes In Christ who earned the Father's will be low All who run to Him would find their rest And even when it seems He hides His face And darkness seems to be our only friend yeah. We look to Christ who suffered in our place That one day all our suffering would end And God is good all of the time, all of the time God is good, God is good all of the time God is good And even when He seems He pays no mind have to guarantee of His great love In Christ who came and left His crown behind That one day we would reign with Him above Yet yeah, God is good all of the time God is good all the time God is good All of the time God is good Lord we believe But help our unbelief Lord we believe But help our hearts to sing Lord we believe Help our unbelief, Lord, we believe. But help our hearts to sing. Yes, you are good all of the time, all of the time. You are good, you are good all of the time. You are good. Yes, God is good. All of the time, all of the time, God is good, God is good, all of the time, God is good. Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief, Lord, we believe, but help our to sing that you are good all of the time all of the time yes, you are good yes God is good all of the time God is good Many 
searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide cause you know and just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am and cause you're perfect in all of your ways yeah you're perfect in all of your ways As you call me Deeper still As you call me Deeper still As you call me Deeper still Into love Love, love You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, and cause you're perfect in all of your ways, yeah, you're perfect in all of your ways, yeah, you're perfect in all of your ways, to us, you're a good, good father, it's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am. It's who I am Jacob for that amazing music. Let's do a virtual round of applause. I'm sure everybody is doing that with me. Right. Anyways, thank you for keeping the village going virtually and keeping us safe and continuing to support the village. That means so much to us. So thank you so much for that. There are three ways to give to the village. The first one is by texting the word give to 404-998-8979. You'll get a text that will run you through all the steps you need to give back. The second way to give back to the village is through our website, thevillageatlanta.com forward slash give. And the third way to give back to the village is by sending a letter of a check to the Village Atlanta Church at 3418 Dogwood Drive, Hayville, Georgia, 30354. Lastly, we have a big announcement. We're having an amazing Easter celebration at the park right across the railroad tracks in downtown Hayville. Um, it is Jess Lucas Park, so bring your lawn chairs, make sure to bring a mask, and have a good time. Thank you for helping us support the village. Have a wonderful day. We love you all so much. Oh
Glory to God, the highest. No other name but Jesus. And all of creation cries out. And glory to God, the highest. Ooh. Messiah, you're high. 
Jacob Causey. I am so glad that you're a part of our tribe known as The Village. That makes me very, very happy. And, of course, love your wife, too, and have missed you all very, very much. Thanks for helping us with the service. And thank you, Emma. You brighten every room, and you made the service better by just doing the announcements for us. Thank you so much. Hey, I wanted to kind of follow up on what Emma said about the Easter service. It's going to be really wonderful, and we're going to move it from in front of the mural we're going to actually move it across the railroad tracks to the park in Hapeville. It's called the Jess Lucas Park. It's beautiful. There's a stage there, and we're going to do the service, and we think it's going to be just very special. We think people are going to come, uh, maybe who haven't been to church in over a year, and uh, we encourage you. You know, people are getting the vaccines down for that. I'm so grateful, but I think that uh, there's still need in being cautious and some people have said, don't you just want to open up? Not yet. Not yet. We're going to be on the cautious side. But outside in the park is about as good as it's going to get. I think it's going to be wonderful. So we'll tell you more about that. But put it on your calendar. Come hang out with us Easter Sunday, Jess Lucas Park, across the railroad tracks, downtown Hapeville. Okay? Well, guess what the anniversary is? You know, one year ago, we shut down the church because of this crazy thing called COVID-19 or the coronavirus. And I remember it well. I remember kind of following the news and realizing this was going to be a serious thing. And we made the decision that we were going to call off Sunday service, which we had never, ever done. And Stan was already in town. He was going to be a part. He was going to be speaking that Sunday. And instead, Stan... Neil and I went up to the church and Stan in an empty room delivered a message and little did we know that would be kind of the way it was going to be for the next 12 months minus a few months in the parking lot. We were not going to be back in the auditorium and haven't been in the auditorium to this day. I uh, have been thinking a lot about this last year. Neil and I were talking and Neil talked about the idea that there's just this drag. It seems like there's just a depression and a fatigue that so many people have, and he's been noticing it more even in his own life as this thing has just dragged on and on and on. And I thought that was very perceptive, and it has led me to think about some things that I think is going to be helpful in this talk because maybe you are feeling the very same thing I know I am. We have certainly been through a lot of stresses, haven't we? I remember when COVID first was announced and we realized that some people were going to go without checks. I remember I was a nervous wreck because I knew there were some people who were not maybe as uh, flush as other people, and they were going to go without checks, and they were going to be devastated. That economic stress drove me crazy. Some of you say, Ray, it drove you crazy. I was in that position. I was the one who didn't have any money, didn't know how I was going to pay the bills. I get it. That had to be a devastating thing. Then, of course, there was political stress it, I, it just was crazy. Instead of us all being able to kind of join hands and arms and say, we're going to get through this together and let's just love each other and figure this out, it, it became a real battle. And it seemed to be over the coronavirus. Some people saying, wear masks. Some people saying, don't wear masks. And some people saying, the scientists don't know. They said two months ago, don't wear masks. And they didn't understand science is an evolving process, right? You understand they don't get it right the first time. As new information comes in, things change, but people didn't know that. And so they were kind of making it political. And it, it's, it's, do we believe this is real? Do we believe it's a hoax? Do we believe Bill Gates that we thought was a wonderful person has now done this so he can affect and kill the whole population of the world? That, that was the kind of craziness that was going on. And then early on, I remember the social stresses. Do you remember, man, when we saw George Floyd killed, we saw Ahmaud Arbery, when we saw Breonna Taylor, and suddenly there was just, maybe we were all sitting at home and we were all finally able to realize some things, that, that this is not, this isn't fair the way things are done uh, towards African Americans. There was something inside of us that said enough, enough, and so we were well, marching with masks on. Do you remember that? Marching Black Lives Matter. And just kind of been a stressful, stressful time. Now we're a year later, and all of the, the psychologists that I have read in magazines have said this, depression and anxiety 
And overall brain fog is at an all-time high. That's exactly what Neil said. He said it's just, it's just been cumulative, and we are just at a saturation point, it seems. Well, I listened to something interesting this week, and this is going to all set up the talk. So this is technical, but you stay with me because it's going to make sense, and it's going to apply to you. Okay, it's going to apply to you. It's applied to me. It's going to be right, I think, what we need today. But I was listening to something interesting on NPR uh, there was a professor, his name's Michael Yassa. He's the professor and chancellor's fellow of neurobiology and behavior at the University of California, Irvine. And um, that's way out of what I know. But he was trying to say things in a way that somebody who doesn't understand a lot of neuroscience things could understand. He said this about our brains. They're very well adapted to deal with acute stresses. When a stress is short term, when it's of a time-limited nature, but then it goes away, he said our brains, the human brain, is wired to just handle that beautifully. But, he said, whenever the stress is prolonged and it becomes chronic, it can wreak havoc on our neurosystem. Ding, ding, ding. That's what Neil was feeling. That's what the psychologists were saying. That's what the neuroscientist confirms. He said it actually causes a persistent increase of cortisol released in our brain, and that can actually reshape our brain circuitry. This has been happening for you. It's been happening for me. He said it happens in two areas. The first area is an area called the hippocampus, which is a complex brain structure that's embedded deep in our temporal lobe, but it's hugely important because it affects our learning and our memory. I promise you, over the last few months, I have said to Jane a hundred times, I don't know why, I am struggling remembering things. I, simple things. She'll tell me simple things and I forget it. Or we play Jeopardy. When we watch TV, sometimes at night we'll watch an episode or two of Jeopardy. And sometimes she wins, sometimes I win. A lot of times we're, we say, boy, I'm glad we're not on that show in front of the whole national audience. But, but a lot of times I'll say, I knew those answers. I just couldn't grab it. I, I knew I knew it. I just couldn't grab it. The same thing with learning things. Uh, this scientist says that that's kind of what has happened when you're under prolonged stress. Then he said the prefrontal cortex is another area of your brain that's affected. And he said that's the area where we make decisions. That's the area where we attend to experience and that's the area where we handle flexibility in our thinking. And he said both of those areas, when we are under prolonged stress, both of those areas are affected. And he said this, the prolonged stress can cause serious cognitive, cognitive deficits. Serious cognitive deficits. It creates things like memory loss. They're calling it pandemic memory brain. Or that sense of fogginess that you just can't shake. Are you tracking with me? Have you felt that or are you just killing it? You're sailing through? No, we're not, right? It doesn't matter what our life has been like over the last 12 months, this has affected us in a way and our brains are not working like they did. Again, this comes from living under political stresses, economical stresses, social isolation, and loneliness. When you do that over an extended period of time, it creates some issues in our brains. The fog is real. Dr. Yassa continued and he said this, we're all walking around with some mild cognitive impairment. He goes on to talk about now we're entering a new season and we all see that when the vaccines are administered, maybe there's gonna be a way we're gonna get back to some kind of normalcy. But he said this, when we see the end in sight, that creates excitement, but it also creates some anxiety about returning to a normal life. We've been altered. We've been made more vulnerable, and we don't really know what's going to happen and where we're going to go. It took us some time to adjust to the pandemic, and it's going to take some time to adapt back to the new normal. So, against that backdrop, I was led to a verse that I think could be helpful to us today because if all of us recognize this, then how are we going to ever get out of the fog? How are we going to ever think again that maybe there's opportunities that are around us that we need to be stepping into when we just feel 
this kind of flat normal that we don't know what to do with. Well, scripture I'm going to read from is in the book of Revelation. I know that's thrilling. Everybody says, boy, I understand that. Not many of us understand it, but there are some wonderful truths, and I think we're going to find a great truth here. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. I want to read about it, and then I want to talk about one particular idea that I think we need to open ourselves up to as we move out of the fog and into our future, okay? Here's the verse. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, and let me just say to those who don't know a lot maybe about Bible study, this isn't Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is a a part of um, Asia Minor. I'll tell you more about it in just a minute, but it's an area that was over in the Bible, Bible days, all right? To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. Here it is. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. Here it is. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, yet you've kept my word and you've not denied my name. Chapters 2 and 3, just to give you a little background of the book of Revelation, are written to the seven churches of Asia Minor. These were real churches. This is written to real people. It's written in an apocalyptic fashion. Um, It's coded, and it's fascinating to get into the codes. But uh, chapter 2 talks about the first four churches that are mentioned, the church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. And then chapter 3, three churches are addressed, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And John is writing, and he's saying these are messages from the Lord. And in these letters... Uh, the church is being commended for good things they're doing, and they've been challenged about some things that they need to do better, some, some wh- areas where they're not living like Jesus. So that's kind of what's taken place. But I like, in the text we read just a moment ago, that promise to the church at Philadelphia of God opening a door for them. Although this church was just a small church, They were trying to follow the way of Jesus. They were trying to follow after Jesus. And the Lord says there's going to be an open door of opportunity before you. I love that. I think it's a message all of us need to hear, especially in the middle of all the brain fog and depression that we have known over the last year. There are open doors all around us. Begin to be aware. Begin to be aware. I've set before you an open door that no one can shut. Door, I like that. It's a rich image, isn't it? It can mean something like safety sometimes, right? You can bolt a door, that means you are safe, or it can mean rejection. He slammed the door in my face, or she slammed the door in my face. A door can sometimes mean privacy and rest. I read recently a survey where people were asked, what's your favorite room in your home? Guess what men said? Men said by a large percentage, they said the kitchen. And anybody want to guess what for most women with young children, what their favorite room in the house was? Would you believe the bathroom? And I think it's because they could shut the door and the little toddler couldn't get in and couldn't pull on their leg and say, mama, mama, mama. Anyway, the door in this passage means none of those things. Rather, the door here is an open door, which is a symbol of boundless opportunities and unlimited chances to do something worthwhile with your life. So today I want to offer some observations about the open door. And then I want to invite you to be an open door person. And uh, I think if we pay attention, listen, I think over the next 15 minutes, we're going to see some things that are going to really kind of register with us. And I know it's put me in an open state where I'm realizing the fog is beginning to lift. Let's kind of get those neurotransmitters, let's get them back in tune, and let's see what this life can really be. Here's the first observation I want to give you. And this is a conviction of mine, and I believe this with everything in me. Our God is an open-door God. Our God is is an open door God, not a closer off of life, but an inviter in to a larger, more beautiful life than you could ever imagine. Some people think Christianity is a narrowing 
down of life, a shrinking of opportunities, a smaller world view. And there's reason for people to think that. Let's be honest, that's how the church often acts, right? The last to embrace science, the last to embrace diversity, the last sometimes to embrace inclusion, the last to see the equality of women. The list goes on and on and on. So so the church has every reason that people think that because the church has modeled that. At least a large percent of the church has modeled that for a long time. But I believe true Christianity or following Jesus into a full life is actually seeing life as an amazing journey that includes opening yourself up to love and adventure in ways that you never realized possible. Our God is an open door God. He loves to present opportunities, challenges, mysteries, surprises, and possibilities to all of us. That tells us something about God and it tells us something about our lives. Open doors will come to us and think about this, they come to us not necessarily because of our giftedness or our boldness or our strength or our networks, but open doors are gifts of grace. Sometimes you have an open door and you think, how did that happen? I, I didn't do anything to deserve that open door. They can come to anybody out of the blue, just a gift from God. And it's always been that way. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Genesis chapter 12. That's when God comes to a man named Abram. You remember that. His first command to Abram is real simple. Go. Just go. That's the first command. Go. Abram says, where? And God said, to the place I'll show you. And I imagine Abram's thinking, that's a little vague. But there was something that stirred inside of him, and he wanted to be a follower of this sense of the divine that he had encountered. And then although God doesn't tell Abraham where, he does tell him why. He says this, you go, and I'm going to bless you so you and all of the people who come after you can bless other people. That's my second conviction I want, to, I want us to think about. Our God is an open door God. And then this, open doors are never primarily just about us. They are about us, but often they are about us and how we turn around and are able to bless others as we ourselves are being blessed. God says to Abraham, I'll bless you, but that blessing is not for you to keep. It's for you to give, you to give. His message to Abraham is two parts, go, through the open door, and then bless others. And bless, if you're un unfamiliar with what that means, uh, that means a statement of goodwill and happiness that's said about another, and then the actions behind it to actually make it happen. It's a way of making good things happen for other people. God does that for us, we do that for other people. God in the Bible is a blessing God. I thought this was really cool. The first time we see the word bless in the Bible, it doesn't even involve human beings. It's in Genesis chapter one, and we're told that God created the great creatures of the sea and the birds of the air. And this is what it says, verses 21 and 22, and I'm reading from the message, chapter one of Genesis. God created the huge whales, all the swarm of life in the waters, and every kind and species of flying birds. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, prosper, reproduce, fill the oceans, birds reproduce on the earth. I love that picture of God blessing fish and the birds. Uh, when our church moved to Hapeville, so many things were changing in our church. We were becoming a more progressive church. And it's not like we set out to do that. It's just we were evolving. We were becoming something different. And I never will forget, a lady in our church came to me and she said, have you ever heard of St. Francis of Assisi? And I said, yes, ma'am, I have studied a lot about St. Francis. And she said, have you ever heard of a blessing of the animals? And I said, yes, ma'am, I have. I have I've read about that. And I had other churches uh, had had blessings of the animals. But see, I came from a Southern Baptist background. 
And that was so far out of anything that I'd ever even thought about. But she said, do you think we could do a blessing of the animals? And as I was kind of evolving, I said, yes, yeah, that sounds lovely. And so we announced it, and uh, we went to the park, and we just made it available. If anybody, you know, animals are gifts, right? Our pets are gifts. They're our children. And even though Jane and I don't have animals because we travel a lot and we're on the road a lot, we, we appreciate and love these precious pets that people have. And so we said, yeah, let's do it at the park. And so people brought their dogs and they brought their cats. And uh, it was, and we did it several years, it was some of the f- most wonderful times I've ever had. They would bring their dog to me. And at first I was a little squirmish, right? Because I, I, I appreciated their love for their dog, but I didn't know their dog very well. But after a while, it was so beautiful to, to lay hands on that animal and say, God, thank you for this precious dog that means so much to this couple. And we just ask that you would bless this dog and the relationship that these people have with this dog. Anyway, I would just pray and they would just cry. And it was a deeply spiritual thing. I think it's interesting that the first thing we read about God blessing was animals in Genesis. But then he creates human beings and uh, God creates them in his own image and God blesses them. Genesis 128, be blessed, again from the message, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, exercise dominion, be responsible, care for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. But that whole idea of be blessed, be blessed. God makes human beings and he says, I set before you an open door. I set before you an open door. All that I have created, it's all for you. Be blessed. But in the process, bless everything around you. Don't pollute the world. Don't pollute the rivers. Don't act selfishly with what I have created for you. Be responsible. Bless. Give back. An open door. Bless others. It's that simple. Where? Wherever you go. When? Well, now, whenever it appears occurs to you that you have an opportunity, you bless others. And people will say, well, I don't know what to do. I haven't been trained. What, what, what do I need to do? Which leads me to a third observation that's important, and that's that open doors start right where you are. Open doors start right where you are. If you don't see yourself going through open doors, it's probably because you've never actually been aware that they are all around you. Every day they're around you. People wonder, where can I find an open door? Where's some glorious, glamorous, faraway place where I can go and I can see this wonderful open door to walk through? And I'm telling you, the open doors are all around us. It might be in volunteering. Some people have said they have gained the greatest uh, sense of, of blessing in helping with things like Safe House. Uh, other th- opportunities that are around to help those who are going through hard times. Uh, fostering a child. We have people in our church that foster children. And what they do is unbelievable. What happened? They saw an open door. Something resonated within them. And now they are touching and helping in a beautiful way. People who've had a rough go of it. Maybe it's writing a book. Maybe it's coaching a little league team. Maybe it's starting a blog that you think can be helpful. Maybe it's teaching a class. Maybe it's like the two ladies that started village groups up over the last uh, month. And by the way, we've heard nothing but outstanding things from the people who are part of the village groups. And if perhaps you want to get on board and you haven't yet, just let us know, thevillageatlanta.com, info at thevillageatlanta.com, and we'll pass that on to the group leaders. But these are people who sensed an open door and they said, Let's walk through it. Maybe it's cutting the grass of a sick neighbor. I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, but do you know how much joy that would cause in someone who maybe was sick and suddenly realized that you were just showing love because you were walking through an open door that just kind of appeared to you? It's a beautiful thing. Here's the fourth observation. Open doors are about opportunities. They're not about guarantees. 
Open doors are about opportunities. They're not about guarantees. So in other words, don't think of open doors as just a path to be more successful. It might be that, but it could be something that's far more profound. One of my favorite chapters in the New Testament is Hebrews chapter 11. It's called the Hall of Fame of the People of Faith. And it's all these Old Testament figures who had incredible faith and who believed this promise of God. But it says of each one of them, they died having never received the promise. And it's worth remembering for me, it's not always about the success of something tangibly coming to us that rewards us for us walking through the doors. Life lived well is more about the person I am becoming than the circumstances I am inhabiting. Can I say that again? Because I want you to really think about this for you. Life lived well is more about the person you and I are becoming than it is about the circumstances we are inhabiting. Now, I'm all for good circumstances, but the most important thing is What kind of person through this life am I becoming? Because that's the primary goal. And a lot of times it will lead to success, and that's fabulous. Uh, Worldly success, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm happy for everybody that's receiving that. But sometimes it's us just becoming better because we have walked through a challenging door and it has made us better people. Here's the thing when, I come to, when it comes to open doors. There are opportunities all around us, and none of them are guarantees. They're just opportunities. Discerning God's will doesn't mean you get a free pass from never failing. And who you become while you're going through a door matters more than which door you go through. You got it? It's all about the growth that we're experiencing. Are we growing? Are we walking through doors that are challenging to us? Well, moving quickly. Next observation is this. Going through an open door does not mean life will be easier on the other side. Going through the open door doesn't mean life will be easier on the other side. Managing the day-to-day, you and I, as we get older and wiser, that does become a little easier. But if you are going to continue to walk through these open doors that God places all around us, it maybe is going to still be challenging for you. Maybe at 50, it's challenging still. Or you have a new open door at 65, it's challenging. Maybe you're like my mother-in-law, she's 91, but she may walk through an open door God has created for her, and it may be a little challenging. That's okay to do challenging things even as we get older. This is funny to me. When in the Bible, in all these unique stories that we read about, when in the Bible does God ever give someone an easy job? Nowhere. God comes to a man named Noah. You know the story, right? God comes to the man named Noah. He says, I want you to leave everything that's familiar to you. I want you to face judgment, ridicule, desolation, enormous difficulty, but, but I will be with you and I'm going to give you a sign, a beautiful rainbow. Or God comes to a man named Abraham and he says, I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave your culture, your family, your people, everything familiar. Go to a place you don't know. I'll tell you when you get there, but I'll go with you, and I'll give you a sign. Circumcision. And I see Abraham saying, "Uh, time out. Noah got a rainbow, and I'm getting circumcision? Can't we rethink that a little bit? Maybe a secret handshake or so? I don't want circumcision. But it's something difficult, right? All through the Bible, that's what we find. Again, I grew up in a church And I remember this kind of a mentality. People would say, well, I don't have peace about that. What I've discovered is I don't have peace about most hard things that I ever attempt. I'm a nervous wreck. I'm stressed. I'm worried. People think that if it's from the Lord or it's divine, you're going to have peace. No, if it's hard, there's, there's usually some stress involved but it shouldn't persuade us or keep us from walking through those open doors that God has created for us. Peace lies on the other side of the open door. Peace isn't this side of the open door, it's on the other side. Peace doesn't lie in getting God to give me other circumstances. Peace lies in finding God in the circumstances right here as we're walking through the open door. Fifth observation, the best way to discern large open doors, big decisions in life, is to practice walking through a lot of small doors. 
That's important. I talked last week about me as a young preacher and some of the things that I learned as a young preacher. And I, I never will forget, I was 18 years old, living in Houston, Texas, and I'd gotten married, living in Texas, started going to a large mega church, and I felt like, well, I'm supposed to be preaching somewhere, and I don't know how to do that. I don't know where, why aren't these churches calling me? Because I'm ready, I, I think, I, what do I need to do? The pastor of this mega church that I was a part of, First Baptist Church, Houston, Texas, famous pastor, John Bassanio, his phone number was in the Houston phone directory. I couldn't believe it. And I remember calling him on a Monday night. He was watching Monday night football, and I said, Dr. Bassanio, you don't know me. I'm Ray Waters, and I come to your church, and I love your preaching, and I, I just want to know, how do I get to preaching and to churches? I, I, I know that's what I'm supposed to do, and I see you, and you do it so well, and I don't know how I'm supposed to do it. So if you don't mind, I know you're watching a football game. Can you kind of give me some advice? And we actually became friends later, but he seemed a little pissy when I did that, and it's probably because somebody called him in the middle of Monday night football, probably at 9.30 at night. I wasn't even thinking. I'm 18 years old. But he, but he said this, had a little edge on his voice, but he said this, why, why do you think a church would ever open up their, their auditorium or pulpit for you to speak? You're 18 years old. But he said there are all kinds of places for you to speak. And he said, do you know in Houston, he gave me the number, I don't remember, but he told me of all of these homeless shelters and places that fed the poor, those who were going through difficult times. And he said, you know, most of them enjoy having sometimes a, a weekly, sometimes a daily service for the people that are living on the streets. I bet if you talk to those people and let them know that you felt called to preach, I bet they would create opportunities for you and give you an opportunity to stand in front of a group of people and speak. And then he said, you know, I believe that probably at our church, First Baptist Houston at the time, I think running about 6,000, he said, I bet there are departments, Sunday school departments, before they break into their classrooms on Sunday morning, I bet there are some of those departments that would want you to kind of do a little uh, something about the lesson for the day, and then they would break into their Sunday school classes. I bet you might have some people that would ask you to do that. And he said, you know, you're at college, Houston Baptist University. I believe that there are probably Bible studies on campus and if you actually wanted to go and speak, there are probably people you could meet and opportunities that would open for you. And he said, you know what? When you do those things, I just think you'll be amazed at the doors that will open for you. And I remember getting off the phone thinking, well, that didn't help because I thought he was just going to roll out the red carpet for me to go speak somewhere. But I started doing exactly what he said. And suddenly I was speaking every night at missions in Houston that were geared towards helping the homeless. And I began to know the people that were living on the streets and they began to know me and I loved them and they loved me. I began speaking at First Baptist Houston for these Sunday school departments, large departments. I began speaking at my little college and uh, there was a, a man who was over the students that were in, interested in ministry. His name was Dr. Bob Newell. And Dr. Newell, after several months, he began to call me and say, hey, there's a church that needs a minister for this Sunday. Would you consider going to this church and being their Sunday speaker? And so I drove all over, probably within three or four hours of Houston, Texas, I drove all over the place on Sundays, and I would stand up in these little churches, country churches, and I would deliver the message. And then somebody would take me home, and we would have a Sunday lunch. And then sometimes they'd give me like $20 for gas for my car, Sometimes they'd give me tomatoes, a box of tomatoes that they had grown, or uh, jelly that they had put up, and that's just the way it worked. Then one Sunday, I spoke at this little church called Second Baptist Church, Rosenberg, Texas. And again, I was just doing what Dr. Bassanio had said do, just go through these little doors that are open for you, and you'll be surprised at what happens. So I speak at this little church. I'm at the time 18 years old. And they said, you know, we don't have a speaker for next Sunday. Would you come back next Sunday? And I said, sure. So I came back the next Sunday. And then I came back the next Sunday. I had now turned 19. And they said, would you consider being our pastor? Now, you've heard me say it's crazy to have a 19-year-old pastor. That's not what I want you to get. But what I want you to get is this naive young guy just walked through all of these little doors 
and bigger doors seemed to open. We tend to romanticize big decisions, but the truth is following after Jesus, this walk with the divine that we talk about is mostly walking through small, what appears insignificant doors all the time. And for those who do that, bigger opportunities seem to open for them. Doesn't have to be big. You just need to start walking through those doors. Very important. Here's the sixth and final observation. You have to reject the myth that says, if I ever choose the wrong door, I'm stuck with God's plan B for the rest of my life. That's something that I struggled with because I I have had some failures, pretty noticeable failures in my life. And there was always this sense of, because there was a failure, then I guess I am now living in God's plan B for my life. You know what? I don't think that is true. I think that that's not true at all. I used to think if any failure was God's plan B. So that meant because I had gone through divorce, then that makes Jane like a plan B for me. Jane is not a plan B. Jane is the most wonderful person on the planet. I am living the dream of God. These failures didn't make that plan B. It just made it another stage in my life. I'm growing, I'm getting better, I'm learning, and that's how you need to understand it too. Life is about growing, learning, and becoming. So don't think just because something failed that that it's over for you. Learn this, if you're not dead, you're not done. Can you say that? If you're not, to say, if I'm not dead, I'm not done. God still has open doors for you. When we're young, we usually end up regretting dumb stuff that we did, right? Wish I hadn't eaten that. Wish I hadn't gone there. Wish I hadn't drank that. Wish I hadn't asked her out. That's the stuff that we did. But you know what happens as we get older? You begin to regret the things that you didn't do. Wish I had gone there. Wish I had said that. Wish I would have risked there. Wish I would have given that. Those are the regrets as we get older. We realize we didn't walk through those doors and we know that's where we should have been. The American psychologist Abraham Maslow observes that we have an inner drive to improve ourselves And he called that self-actualization, right? We've all heard about self-actualization. But Maslow uses the Jonah story, Jonah not really being happy about going through the open door, from the Old Testament to illustrate a theory that he calls the Jonah complex. It's a syndrome where ambivalence about growth keeps people from becoming who they can be. Maslow observed that there are competing commitments full of fears of all kinds, which are preventing us from realizing our loftiest goals. He said, we fear our highest possibilities. We are generally afraid to become that which we can glimpse in our most perfect moments, under the most perfect conditions, under conditions of great courage. He goes on, we enjoy and even thrill to the godlike possibilities we see in ourselves in such peak moments, and yet... We simultaneously shiver with weakness, awe, and fear before these very same possibilities. So often we run away from the responsibilities dictated or even suggested by nature or fate, even sometimes by accident, just as Jonah tried in vain to run away from his fate. In other words, we don't walk through the open doors. We know that we've experienced enormous positive things but something makes us afraid. And we say, I'm not going through it. I'm not going through it. God keeps after Jonah. At the end of the book, we don't know if Jonah's ever gonna embrace the open door or not. Jonah ends up just sitting under a tree, just kind of pouting and not at all pleased with the direction that he's supposed to go. And I realize the reason that the story is left like that is because it's a story about you. It's a story about me. Are we gonna sit under a tree and just Regret that we didn't walk through the open doors that are all around us. God is saying, I've set before you open doors. The secret of life is the secret of the open door. The unheard 
unseen, unnoticed, overlooked, God prompted, God powered, God opened door. Jesus made his life in an adventure in unlimited opportunities to do good, to touch a leper, to have fellowship with a prostitute, to welcome tax collectors that nobody else had welcomed, to bless little children, to teach, to heal, to challenge. And the leaders, they were offended by all the things that he did. And so they killed him. And they laid his body in a tomb. But on the third day, God rolled away the stone and said to his son, See, I have set before you an open door. And ever since that day, the fellowship of the open door has been unstoppable when we do it right, when we love the way we're supposed to love, when we see it as an adventure the way we're supposed to see it as an adventure. And that's who we want to be at the village. That's who we are often at the village, the church of the open door, because we're open door people. We're resurrection people. That's what the church is supposed to be. And the door that closes us in on ourselves, the door of selfishness, the door of death, the door of shame, it's been opened wide. And Jesus has commissioned us to walk through the open door and then to help other people walk through that open door and then to realize open doors are all around us. And when we walk through them and we see life as a blessing and our ability now turns to blessing others, we live that open door life. Well, I've been in a brain fog too. I've been depressed too. I've been anxious too. But it feels like we're on the verge of coming out of what we have been in over the last year. And for me, over the last week, I am looking around for open doors because I want to walk through them. I want to be sensitive to them. And I want you to be sensitive to them too. Well, thanks for hanging with me. Let me say a prayer for all of us, okay? I can't wait to see you soon. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this talk. Thank you for being an open door God who wants us to walk through those doors, not because it's necessarily going to make us the most successful guy in town. It's not about that. It's about you blessing us and us blessing others and us growing into the people that you've created us to be, growing and learning. And that's where we want to be in this life. Help us be open door people. Help us as we move out of the fog, as our brain becomes again what we remember it can be as we, we leave this past year behind. Help us see around us all the little open doors. And I thank you for loving us and being the God that you are. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Blessings to you, everybody. Love you. Thank you.